Thank you for joining us from Margin Notes in the Central Church of Christ in Paducah, Kentucky. As you can see, this video covers Psalms 21 through 25, and this will be the fifth and final video we're doing on the book of Psalms this time. If you've been watching before, you know that because Psalms is so long uh, that we're taking videos just five poems at a time, and this being uh, the fifth of those, uh, and we'll have covered at that point, what, a sixth of the book of, of Psalms. We're going to stop uh, here and go elsewhere in Scripture. At the end of this video, we will let you know uh, what our plan is going forward. And uh, if, if you, this first time you've watched Margin Notes, maybe you haven't watched in a while, uh, we've covered a lot of the Bible, and it's kind of remarkable this is still going. Uh, but uh, we would love for you to subscribe uh, to Facebook or to YouTube or both. We release Margin Notes on both those outlets. And... Uh, catch up, go back, and again, at the end of the video, we will let you know what our plan is going forward. As we've said before, I'll say it again here one more time, the book of Psalms is one of my favorite books, but it is kind of scattershot. It's not a narrative. It's not a letter. And so some of these notes may seem very, very random. And, and I apologize for that because there's no good way to avoid that in this type of video. This is not meant to be a deep dive into any particular uh, verse, much less any particular uh, poem. And so uh, hopefully these things don't confuse you. Hopefully there are things you can uh, write down uh, or add to a file on a com your computer, study later and say, hey, that's helpful to my Bible study. I'd like to add it to my notes you know, elsewhere in my Bible or uh, wherever you keep your Bible study notes. And so maybe these things help you along the way. So let's dive right in. We'll get through these five poems and then uh, let you know what our plan is going forward. Let me hit the right button. That'd be very helpful. An outline of Psalm 21. Um, and this is a bit odd. As you can, if you look at this carefully, you can already see that the first point doesn't contain the first verse. I like this outline this way. You may want to flip number one and number two just so the first verse actually comes first. I totally get that. And maybe this shouldn't be an outline. I almost did this graphically on here, uh, but I just decided not to. You may, instead of an outline for this psalm, want to put, and this is going to be backwards, and that's going to work better, sort of a V shape on the outside, verse 1, verse 13, and call it the king's devotion given, and then in the middle of that V have the king's desires given. That might be the better way to do it instead of actually writing out an outline. Again, I, I probably should have done that graphically, but uh, you may just want to flip the outline, uh, make number 1 the king's devotion given, verse 1 and verse 13, so the first and last verses, and then make number two, the king's desire given. I kind of prefer it this way. I actually prefer the graphic one a little more. Whatever works for you. You may hate the outline and just want me to move on. That's fine, too. <laughs> so we will. Uh, so you may want to screenshot that and just think about how you'd like to include that one. Um, but it is one of those things where the first verse and the last verse very much go together. And then the biggest part of the poem, 2 through 12, just sort of form the, the meat of this entire um, psalm, this entire poem written by David. Psalm 21 and verse 4. Um, speaking of God, it says, He asked a life of you, you gave it to him, length of days, forever and ever. I've got the wrong verse, don't I? It's verse 2, Psalm 21 and verse 2, I'm sorry. You have given him his heart's desire and have not withheld the requests of his lips. I have a note for verse 4. I forgot to change the slide to verse to verse 2. His heart's desire is the key here. Probably what is mentioned here, if you watch the last video, we may have noticed, remember we said that uh, Psalm 20 and Psalm 21 kind of go together. So his heart's desire may actually be referring back to Psalm 20. Uh, Psalm 20 in verse 4 uh, says, may he grant you your heart's desire. Well, Psalm 21 in verse 2, you have given him his heart's desire. And since these poems seem to be sort of telling a similar uh, story or one's before the battle, one's after the battle, there's probably a connection uh, between those two things. Psalm 21 and verse 9. Again, I have a note on Psalm 21 4, but I didn't include the video, so I apologize for the confusion on the last one. You will make them appear, excuse me, you will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. The Lord will swallow them up in his wrath and fire will consume them. I, I've written out to the side of my Bible the note that our God is a consuming fire. Now, the New Testament uses that phrase to speak of God, and here you have it pictured uh, in, in a battle um, time or a time uh, as victory has been won, but now they're looking forward to other things. But it's also interesting to think about that concept being mentioned here, pictured, and in the New Testament used of God himself, for our God is a consuming fire. Uh, if, if God is not followed, 
You don't want to think about the wrath of God. Uh, but one of these days, we're all going to be confronted with it, whether we want to be or not. Here, that's pictured in a poetic way, military way, but it's just a good reminder of that spiritual fact for us as well. Psalm 22, you may want to write before the poem that of all the Psalms, and this one's not super long. I forgot how many verses are in it. There are 31 verses, which is long for a Psalm, but it's not Psalm 119. It's not even Psalm 18. It has 50 verses. This one has, you know, 30 verse, 31 verses. But of all the poems, this is the most quoted one in the, in the New Testament. Um, it's a messianic psalm, uh, as you know, it's from the very beginning. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You're automatically at the cross of Jesus. But there's other things throughout this poem uh, that seem to um, echo uh, Jesus when he comes, or be echoed in Jesus. That's what I was looking for, when he comes. But of all the poems in the psalms, this is the most quoted one. In the New Testament. Um, just an interesting note there for your little bit deeper Bible study. The phrase that opens the verse, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This, I have this connected to the New Testament because you remember, obviously, Jesus says those words from the cross. But you may have noticed sometime when you're reading through the Bible or maybe someone was reading a passage before the uh, Lord's Supper and they, they read Jesus' account kind of the cross. And sometimes they read in the New Testament, Eli, Eli. Lama Sabachthani, and other times I read this really weird phrase, Eloi, E-L-O-I, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani. The reason that's the case, it's obviously Jesus is quoting Psalm 22, 1, is that Matthew records that, and the way we have it is in Greek. Mark records it in Aramaic, which was a dialect, um, and so that's why they're very similar, but not the same. Um, again, Eli is more the, the Greek term. Eloi is more the Aramaic term. Both are straight quotations, obviously, of my God uh, back here in Psalm 22. But it's just interesting. Again, I have that noted you know, for the New Testament uh, because this is quoted by Jesus on the cross, but it's recorded for us not in two different ways, but it, but from two different dialects. It's more technically a language and a dialect. I guess is a more proper way of, of saying that, that you may find interesting as to why sometimes you see Eli, and other times this very weird to us word, Eloi, uh, found in the book of Mark. Psalm 22, verses 9 and 10. David says, Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust uh, you at my mother's breasts. On you I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you, ha you have been my God. Basically what David is saying, because this is a very difficult psalm, he's struggling, is you've been with me from birth, why not now? Um, and I have that note because sometimes you and I may feel that way. God, you've been with me all this time, why aren't you here now? Now we know he is, and by the end of the poem, even David will recognize that. But it's powerful that David basically just writes that. It's as if God's been with me you know, even from before I was born, and now he's not. Um, and so just a simple thought, a simple way to kind of word those couple of verses in a way that might be more of a way we would say them, a way we would understand them. Psalm 22 and verse 14, as David describes his just how awful things are for him, I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. By the way, every one of these phrases, including verse 15 also, are just, you, you could do at least a devotional thought, if not an entire lesson on each one of these phrases. But the one I have a note for here is my bones, all my bones, are out of joint. Now, some people said, well, that, you know, that means literally he's disfigured, and that's possible. But I think he's more poetically saying he's just all out of sorts. Um, it could hint at some physical troubles. By the way, there should be a period or a semicolon or something after the word sorts. This is not meant to be one long sentence. I apologize for that. Um, it could hint at some physical troubles, you know, maybe aches and pains, that sort of thing. But I think just more poetically, if you put all these things together, some of them are very poetic, you know, I'm poured out like water. Well, obviously that's not literal. Uh, my heart is like wax and melted. That's obviously not literal. So I don't think bones out of joint is literal either. I think he's just saying, I'm all out of sorts here. And it may, again, hint at some physical trouble, some aches and pains that are coming from just how uh, down and out he is. But I think it's more just how totally out of it, if you please, uh, David is in so many ways because of this situation. Before Psalm 22 and verse 22, um, I just have this note that the rest of the psalm, so from verse 22 through verse 31, shows trust, and it's written in a way as if God has already answered. For 21 verses, David has written, you know, 
longing for God and how terrible it is and how God doesn't seem near and all these things. And if you just stop after verse 21, you would think this is terrible. And it is. David's in a bad situation. But then beginning of verse 22, he writes as if God's already answered the request. Um, he knows God will. And so he writes that way. And so the last, what's that, nine or ten verses are words of trust in God, even though the circumstances are still horrific uh, for David, but he still trusts God. And what a lesson, he, don't, don't, don't be preaching, that's not what these videos are for, but you kind of want to when you when you come when you think about that and come across that concept in these types of poems where things are awful, by the end, there's still trust, there's still hope, because God is still on the throne. An outline of the very famous Lord is my shepherd psalm, uh, I know where I got this one. Uh, this outline uh, is one that I adapted from Dan Winkler, and the and it actually has a title, He's All I Want. You may have heard the story many times about the girl who decided to quote Psalm 23, and she forgot the wording, and she said, The Lord is my shepherd, he's all I want. Um, obviously, we could, do, we could do multiple videos making notes on just this globally famous <laughs> psalm, but uh, here is an outline you may find helpful. He's all I want in destitute times uh, because there's no, uh, there's no green uh, pastures. There's, he needs still waters. He's all I want in downcast times. He restores my soul. Uh, he leads in paths of righteousness. He's all I want in disturbing times, valley the shadow of death. He's all I want in directionless times. The rod and staff are there to comfort and give direction. He's all I want in dangerous times. The presence of the enemies are there. He's all I want in damaged times, head being uh, need, needing to be, excuse me, uh, anointed with oil. You can find, I, I would guess, a hundred plus outlines on Psalm 23 without all that much work. I just really like this one. And I know it also, it, it leads off, leaves off the sixth verse. I totally understand that. But I just really like this one, partly because the cuteness of it, he's all I want, uh, but also because then it gives a simple thought by each of these just so well-known, beautiful phrases of what's probably the most well-known psalm out of all 150. Psalm 23 and verse 3, by the way, well, i got a couple more notes on this psalm because, I, like I said, we could spend videos on this if we really wanted to, but we're, just, we're going through as quickly as we can. He restores my soul, and then he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. But the phrase, he restores my soul, the note that I have is that, that literally the Hebrew is, he causes life to return to me. Now, to be fair, it can also literally be he causes soul to return to me because life and soul were similar term terms. But the, the note that I have by way of application is, does God care about what I do? Yes. But God also cares for my disposition. God cares for my feelings. Um, it's not just about intellect. It's not just about action, although it is about those couple of things. But it's also about how I feel. What's my disposition? Uh, and so God returns life to me. Um, is just a beautiful thought there that David includes in this beautiful poem. Psalm 23 and verse 5, one of the more famous pictures, the end of the verse, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Oil was used to anoint a lot of things. Um, of course, famously, oil was used to anoint you know, prophets and priests and kings, set them, setting them up for uh, those particular roles. That's not the case here. That's not what this is talking about. This is not saying you're making me a prophet, you're making me a priest, you're making me a king, even though David writes it. He's not talking about that. Remember, you have to keep this in the context of the shepherd and sheep picture. Shepherd wasn't making a sheep a prophet, I guarantee you that. It's the oil of healing. And it's on the head to symbolize total healing or possibly the more vulnerable, vulnerable part of the body. I think it's more total healing because you pour oil on the head and it's going to run down um, everything uh, of, of the body. And so God anoints with, with healing and he anoints with total healing is the picture behind that just beautiful phrase. And don't you wish we had more notes on Psalm 23, but this is on Psalm 21 through 25. So let's go on to Psalm 24. This psalm, we don't know when it was written, but I looked at two or three commentaries, a couple for sure, and there seems to be some consensus that at least possibly, and you might even word it probably, this poem could have been composed when the Ark of the Covenant was brought to Mount Zion, to Jerusalem. And you have there the references, 2 Samuel 6, 2 Chronicles 13, to when that happened. Now, there's just some things here that fit that very well. And so 
scholars, again, I don't want to say they're in total agreement, but there seems to be some consensus that even even though we have to say we don't know that possibly and maybe even probably that's when this poem was written to, to either mark that occasion or remember that occasion uh, when the Ark of the Covenant was finally brought to Jerusalem, to Mount Zion. Psalm 24 and verse 2, speaking of God, for he has founded it, um, the, let's, let's read verses 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. I, I have a note here, that could be sort of a veiled reference to creation week because you recall that God separated the waters and made the dry dry land appear, Genesis 1 and verse 9. That could be at least um, poetically, or as I say here, in a veiled way, why this is where this way he founded the earth upon the seas. It's a weird way of wording it, um, but it makes a lot of sense in the thinking of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 9 that God parted the waters and made um, the dry land appear. That may be, again, just a veiled reference to that. In here in Psalm 24 and verse 2. Here's an outline of Psalm 25. All my members, I got this from the internet. I don't remember where, <laughs> but I really like this outline uh, for a 22 verse poem. Uh, trust, verses 1 through 5, a prayer to live without shame. Transgressions, verses 6 through 14, a prayer to live without sin. And troubles, the last, what, seven or eight verses, a prayer to live without sorrows. Really good outline. Again, I'm going to hurry through these, but uh, you can screenshot this or pause the video to write that down. Um, I'm not great at making outlines. I wish I could make one that good. That's a really good outline of this poem. Psalm 25 and verse 7 contains two words that are very similar but have different shades of meaning. Remember not the sin, and really it's sins in the English Standard Version, of my youth or my transgressions. Now, they mean similar things. But you can tell because there's such different translations, sins, and again it should be plural, and transgressions are not the same word. Why? Well, the word sin literally means missing the mark or, or falling, uh, falling off the way. Transgressions is rebellion. And so what some, uh, Eddie Clover in his commentary mentioned this, I know specifically, suggests that sin, and, and since David specifically mentioned sins of my youth, um, he may be saying, you know, don't remember that stuff from when I just screwed up because I was young. You know, I just messed up. But also my transgressions, when I willfully rebelled. Um, that may be overstating it a little bit, but I think it gets at sort of the, the, uh, the sense of why David would use these two different words. Uh, transgressions, they're all wrong, okay? But transgressions is a much stronger word, it seems to me. And so that's probably why you have both of them mentioned here in Psalm 25 and verse 7. In Psalm 25, verse 14, the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. Now, I know there's very different translations here. I believe it's the uh, New American Standard Bible has uh, secrets of the Lord, and there's some other translations. So what I have here, and the English Standard Version has a footnote here that's similar to this, but uh, I make it my own note, is the word trans, uh, friendship can mean secret counsel. And so the reason you have friendship as the translation is because the word means I'm close with God. He's talking to me. He's, he's, he's near me. I'm near him. That sort of thing is sort of bound up in uh, the word and also the context here, the meaning of the phrase in Psalm 25 and verse 14. And so it's, it's not that I'm changing God's mind. God's not my buddy. That's not it. But it is this idea of I am near to God. And it's as if we have that special relationship where I get counsel from him. Uh, David's trying to picture that here, and it's for those who fear him. Anyone, not just David, but anyone who fears God can have that uh, relationship or that feeling with God. So there you go. There's some margin notes for Psalm 21 through 25, including Psalm 23, which we could have spent forever on, it seems like, because every, everyone loves that poem, and rightfully so. So that concludes uh, six videos, or excuse me, five videos on the book of Psalms, one-sixth of the book. And as we've said a few times, uh, that's as far as we're going to go in Psalms for now. If you're watching these as they're being released, uh, this video is being, being released the, the Thursday before Thanksgiving in 2022. Our plan is to take the remainder of 2022 off from releasing videos. I know it's a little bit of a lengthy break, but uh, just 
peel back the curtain a little bit here. I record these pretty far in advance. You may you may notice that just because the clothes I'm wearing. A lot of times the ones that come out in the summer, I'm wearing you know a sweater, <laughs> and the ones that come out in the winter time, I'm wearing short sleeves like I am right now. Um, but I also try to stay far enough ahead in my study and things to where I'm not right up against things, uh, where I really have time to. Because some of these notes I already have, and as I say every time, I'm restudying these books uh, for myself, but also to prepare for these videos. And so to give me a little extra time, a little lag time, if you will, and frankly to give you some time to um, go back and rewatch some videos or watch some you haven't seen already or whatever, we're going to take uh, the remainder of 2022 off. And then, Lord willing, at the beginning of 2023, we're going to come back and begin uh, with a with a run through three consecutive books, Joshua, Judges, and Ruth. That's the plan. Uh, I'm not sure how many videos that will be. I haven't, I haven't even started outlining them or anything yet as this is being recorded. But that's the plan is to go back to the Old Testament narrative and cover Joshua, Judges, and Ruth uh, in turn and then figure out where we're going to go beyond that. Uh, and so we hope all these videos encourage you. Uh, we hope you appreciate or understand, excuse me, that we're taking a little bit of break, but uh, we already have a plan to go forward. We're not just stopping margin notes. We're just taking a break uh, for a few weeks to uh, get some other things done, get some more study uh, done so these videos are helpful, and frankly, some of my Bible studies better uh, as, as I study these books as well. So make sure you subscribe to the Facebook page, YouTube channel uh, for when videos are released, all of our videos, not just margin notes, a lot of our things we do from time to time on those uh, outlets and hope that everything we do encourages you. But always, we hope Margin Notes encourage you to read the Bible, study the Bible, and live the Bible. Thanks for watching.